Hi, my name is Desiree and I'm going to be placing catheter here in Scout. Scout needs an upper and a lower scope today. So um, Scout here is a very good boy. He's a little nervous, but otherwise he's very sweet. So to start putting a catheter in, you have to shave the area to get a nice sterile area performed. Some hospitals only have you shave the top part. Our hospital is to shave all around the leg so that when we remove the catheter, it's not hurting his foot by ripping the tape off of his fur. Um, so uh, Scout did not like getting poked. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap him so he feels nice and secure um, with his legs sticking out. So we can still, he's got all, he feels more secure when he's got his body wrapped into a burrito, but we still have access to his leg. Okay, so I'm just going to place an intravenous catheter on this cat. The leg is already shaved, so I'm gonna start by scrubbing with chlorhexidine and alcohol. That just prevents any bacteria from the skin getting into the site and causing an infection. Opening the IV catheter. Okay, I hit the vein and fed the catheter in. So catheter is just a piece of plastic that sits in the vein because when we do anesthesia, we can't just leave a needle in there because the needle would probably fall out and the animal would feel it. So this helps us to be able to give all the drugs and fluids that they need IV, but it's comfortable for them and it's secure for us. It's not just gonna fall out. And I'm just using bandaging tape to tape this in because of course, if we didn't tape this in, the cat would move and the piece of plastic would just back right out of the vein. This thing hanging off the catheter is called a T-set. And the reason we put in one of those is just so that we can access the catheter easier without really having to move where it is so close to the vein. So I can either stick a needle through this port or I can take off a needle and attach a syringe like this directly to this line. And when I unclamp it, I can flush with saline and I feel it actually going up his vein all the way up his arm. So I know that I'm in. I'm gonna clamp that again and we're gonna use more tape, again, just to make sure that it does not move, because of course you can't tell animals not to chew on things, um, and all they feel is something weird sitting in their arm, so a lot of them will try to lick or chew their catheters. I like to put on a little strip of what we call vet wrap. It's just a bandaging material. I feel like this keeps the site clean, and it just helps everything to stay in place so in case they move around a lot, everything can't just slide down the limb and fall out of the vein. So, and it's a cute color. We try to make them fashionable. And then we have one last little piece of tape that I'm gonna put in a little loop for my tea set so that this is right and handy on top. And that is it. That is an IV catheter placement. So now Scout's ready for his scope. So we're gonna go ahead and get him anesthetized, okay? So you always start by checking the catheter. You always flush and make sure it's patent before you give any drugs. And his is flushing just great. So now I'm gonna give him his pre-medication and this is just gonna make him a little sleepy and kind of take the edge off. I'll flush it in. And now we're gonna wait a little bit for that to kick in. While we're waiting, Ryan's gonna go ahead and hold the oxygen up to him. And we're going to pre-oxygenate because that's very important when you're doing anesthesia for any patient. Ideally, you want them pre-oxygenated for five to 10 minutes before you induce. And you want to do the least amount of stress on the kitty as possible. And while we're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to place a blood pressure cuff on Scout. So I can start getting a blood pressure monitoring on him because he's a calm gentleman anyway. Hi, sweetheart. So I'm just waiting for my blood pressure reading to make sure he's all good while he gets his oxygen. And his blood pressure is great right now. And you can kind of see how Scout's 
He's a little nervous, but he's a good boy, and he's just starting to feel the drugs and just nice, get nice and calm for us. So we're gonna go ahead and get in Scout and do so we can start our scope. And after any drug that you give IV, you always flush it in. Okay, let's turn the scalp towards me. So Ryan's gonna go ahead and hold his tongue for me. So I'm gonna intubate him, which basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get an airway on him. I'm putting a little lidocaine back there just cause cats are very sensitive back there. And they like to close their larynx and then I can't get a catheter in. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my tube Put a little bit of sterile lube on there so that it's a little lubricated and not so dry. And then I'm gonna go ahead and place my tube. So I'm gonna go ahead and in. I'm gonna feel for my placement. And what we're gonna go ahead and do is tie his tube in so it doesn't come out. Check placement one more time. Okay, and then you always go behind the head on kitties. Now what we're gonna do is put him on his side and hook him up to oxygen. And then Ryan's gonna help me get him all hooked up to all the anesthesia. So right now I'm checking for a leak in his tube. He's got a little bit of a leak because he's not holding. So what I'm gonna do is put a little bit of air in the tube to inflate it, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm testing the tube again. And this time it's holding. Ryan, can you do me one more favor? We're gonna do a secondary test and he's gonna listen for me to find out if he hears any swooshing sounds. Okay, good? Okay, so we're all good. So no leak, I'm gonna turn on my gas so that he is gonna get good and sleepy. We maintain him under anesthesia with gas anesthesia. If you hear that beeping, that's gonna be his heart rate. They're very important that you lube his, eye, his uh, eyeballs because he needs to keep his eyes nice and hydrated so he doesn't develop any issues. Okay, so all the lubrication is very important. And if there's a little extra, let's wipe it on the sides here. So I'm gonna go ahead and hook him up to fluids. Ryan's gonna go ahead, we're doing an upper lower scope on him. So Ryan's gonna go ahead and start um, Atomizing him so that he is good to go and his butt's going to be clean for the doctor, the colon. And I'm also going to get a temperature on him real quick. And you always want to listen to as well. We're just avoiding any stool getting on her tail. And that way we can keep it up and out of the way. Okay, so this is our little kitty friend here who is presented for chronic weight loss and vomiting, which we very commonly see in our older kitties. On his original ultrasound, he has some intestinal thickening. And unfortunately, ultrasound and other tests cannot further give us that answer as to what's causing this. And so the easiest way to try to get some answers is to do an endoscopy on our kitty friend in which we're gonna go down with a camera. We're gonna look at the esophagus, the stomach, and the small intestines. And more importantly, take some biopsy samples so we can get a better idea as to what's going on and how we can help our little kitty friend. So here we're gonna go ahead and start our endoscopy. We're looking at the back of the throat. We can see that the endotracheal tube is nicely placed. We're looking at the areas of the esophagus. Cats have two different parts of their esophagus, so we're looking for any erosions, ulcerations, and we're kind of documenting and taking pictures as we're going down, sometimes some videos. So this is a good image of a nice normal esophagus in a kitty. They have both striated and smooth muscles, so it kind of looks different as we're going down. Nice normal blood vessels. We can actually see the heart through the chest there, which is beating nice and normally. 
We're looking for any areas of polyps, erosions, acid reflux, anything like that. So far, everything looks great. And interestingly, in most kitties that we're doing our endoscopies on, the scope itself is actually fairly unremarkable. What we're really uh, attempting to get is good diagnostic biopsies so we can do specialized stains and samples to get our actual diagnosis. So on this image here, we can see that's the valve that's called the lower esophageal sphincter, and that's the differentiation between the esophagus and the stomach. And so we're gonna go ahead and pop right in with our camera. So then we can get some good visualization of the stomach lining. So this is the normal kind of folds of the stomach. This is a great image that looks fairly normal. Manipulate our camera a little bit to look around. We want to distend and look at all aspects of the stomach. We just distend with normal air and then we'll suck that air out so they're not gassy post their endoscopy. Aside from the generalized risk of anesthesia in which we always do traditional blood work and x-rays and advanced imaging to make sure that they're as healthy as possible, the risk of endoscopy in both canine and feline patients is very low um, with like less than 0.05% of complications associated with the procedure, which is why we often elect to choose this over surgical assessments because we can get great diagnostic samples without putting a lot of risk to the patient. So this stomach looks pretty normal. Although there's some foam down there, that's the what's called the pyloric valve. So that's the valve that separates the stomach from the small intestines. So we just slid through his pyloric valve. So now we're in the upper small intestines. And the majority of the intestines that we can biopsy is the upper small intestine called the duodenum and sometimes the very top part of the jejunum. The contraindications of doing endoscopies in kitties is if their problem is very far down in their middle part of their small intestines, very much like how we learn in the magic school bus, um, there's many, many feet of small intestines and we can't get to all aspects of it. And so if the problem is very far down the intestinal tract, then we will sometimes surpass the endoscopy procedure and go straight to surgery. But most kitties and dogs are amenable to endoscopy. So here we can get really nice visualization of the small intestines. Subjectively, this should look a little bit more smoother. So we're gonna say that this looks thickened. Sometimes we use the term like a cobblestone appearance where it looks a little bit more lumpy bumpy. So I think something's going on in this kitty's GI, but again, the scope itself doesn't give us that answer. The biopsies will be much more diagnostic for us. And so we'll start uh, resuming and taking some samples now. And we take many different samples from all the different segments of the bowel in order to get a really good representation of what's going on because sometimes the problem is not in one specific area, it's in multiple. And so we get a better representation even than in some surgical biopsies by doing an endo endoscopy sample. We're taking pretty small samples, so no um, endangerment to the patient. They won't miss this little tissue missing from them, um, but it's enough for us to get diagnostic answers. So we take small little sippet samples from multiple segments to try to give us that diagnostic information we need. And with these little tiny samples, we're gonna do multiple assessments on them. So there's kind of fancier diagnostics that we will do in almost every, especially feline patient, to make sure we're getting the most information we can from our samples and minimizing from having to do the procedure more than once. Um, as we can see here, there's like very minimal little bleeding It always on the camera and on the big screen, it looks like a lot. Those are a few drops of blood, which will heal up and just um, by the time it's all done, um, there's almost never associated extreme bleeding associated with this procedure. Again, overall considered to be very safe. And in many patients, we can get away with doing just an upper GI endoscopy because we can get so far down with our cameras um, into the upper part of the small intestines. If patients have certain changes on their ultrasound, on their blood work changes, etc., we will sometimes do a lower GI endoscopy as well, um, which is a very similar type procedure. We're just going through the back end, whereas, um, but the biopsy procedure and technique is essentially the same. And so far, this kitty's doing very well, being monitored continuously under general anesthesia. We're monitoring blood pressure, oxygen levels, making sure all the breathing rates and things are nice and normal, open. Um, this is often uh, closed. 
Um, sometimes there's a little bit of stimulation when we go through the valves, but otherwise um, this kitty can't even feel us doing this procedure. So um, nice is that it's a non-painful thing that we do. Won't wake up with any discomfort. Sometimes there's a little bit of gas distension if we can't get all the gas out, um, but most animals do fantastic. Open. Closed. And also on endoscopy, we're looking for things like polyps or ulcers or masses. Oftentimes those can get identified on an abdominal ultrasound as well, but not always, especially because gas in the GI tract can obstruct images on an ultrasound, where when we're in the lumen of the bowel, um, that's unobstructed, we can see straight through. So we can often diagnose things that can't even be seen on ultrasound tests. Open. Close come back out as towards the mouth, and then we'll biopsy samples of the stomach, taking multiple samples there. Um, we don't often biopsy the esophagus as we're just trying to look, and that tissue is very tough. Open, close. So we're mainly getting small intestinal and gastric samples, and then obviously in the lower small intestine, we get colonic biopsies, and oftentimes we can get through the valve that connects the small intestine to the colon, which is called the ileum, and we go through the ileocolic valve, and then we can take small intestinal biopsies from the back end as well, which again is sometimes indicated and sometimes not. Open. And as we go through, we suction the uh, stomach out, again, to prevent any gas accumulation, so they're nice and comfortable after. And as you can see, that's a post-biopsy little bite there. It's just almost like leaves like a little tiny bruise, and that's it. Again, patient won't even feel it at all once they're awake from anesthesia. Open, close. And as we can see, for the most part, we can do these upper GI endoscopies pretty quickly. Um, the colonoscopies are a little bit more time consuming in the sense that we have to give some enema preparations um, while they're under. We try not to force our patients to do a lot of colonoscopy prep as humans do, as we all know how unpleasant that could be. And so we um, often we'll give them enemas when they're awake when we're doing colonoscopy procedures and then just give them a couple enemas when they're under to try to clean them out enough so we can get. Sometimes we do have to give them medications open prior to close um, anesthesia so they can evacuate their bowels a little bit. That's more particularly in animals that we really need to see the fine details of the colon lining and or the really big dogs in order to make sure that they're fully prepared so we can get the best diagnostic samples that we can. So when there's not a specific lesion that we're looking for, we're just taking uh, biopsies from different segments of the bowel just to get a good representation as to what's going on. I'm gonna deflate this kitty. We'll suck as much gas out as we can. And that will really be completion of our upper GI endoscopy. Let's see how messy this is. So this is actually an example of a very nice, healthy colon. Some adequate prep there. So we take some turns because they have kind of your the colon lining does or the colon lumen does have some flexures in it. So we kind of make the zigs and zags to try to get through it like a maze. And then we're looking and evaluating the lining, looking for any abnormalities. And then once again, very similar to the upper GI endoscopy, we're going to uh, take some samples. So straight ahead, the big open tube is what's called the cecum, which is unique to animals. People um, don't have cecums. It's kind of similar to an appendix in which it's a blind sac where there's ingesta. We don't normally biopsy there, but we can see that tissue looks nice and normal. And this little thing that's a button just above me, that's the ileocolic valve. So that's a small, tiny valve that separates the ileum from the colon. And so it's separating the small intestines from the large intestines. So sometimes we can get in there and sample and see this is a pretty tiny kitty. So we're gonna see if we can at least get some forceps in there to get some samples of the back end of the small intestines. So again, we're just taking good representative samples of this kitty's colon. Everything looks grossly normal, so we're just trying to get in a good assessment to make sure the biopsy answers are, rep are representative of the full diagnostic detail. And again, on the samples we do, we do it typically at least three types of sampling on particularly the upper small intestines, uh, which we do histopathology open, 
immunohistochemistry and specialized PAR testing close to help rule out any different types of forms of cancers, um, particularly, and then the regular biopsy also helps diagnose any types of inflammation, infection, other diseases that we could be dealing yeah, with. Yeah, so most of the time in cats with small intestinal thickening, the most common differential, especially in kitties that are, are older, normally over 10 years old, are inflammatory bowel disease, which is benign inflammation, essentially immune-mediated disease similar to Crohn's disease, open in humans, and close. And so inflammatory bowel disease or IBD is one of them. And then the other one is unfortunately kitties over time, they can, as their inflammation potentially progresses and or a disease just by itself, they're predisposed to a condition that's called small intestinal lymphoma. Small intestinal lymphoma is very different than other forms of lymphoma in cats in which more normal lymphomas open form in large lymph nodes clothes and masses. Small intestinal lymphoma in kitties often looks very normal with very mild thickening or a completely normal ultrasound. So the only way to diagnose that is with an endoscopy. Um, but the good thing is that it, small cell lymphoma typically tends to be a much more treatable form of the disease. And that's how we diagnose that off the biopsy. In younger kitties, we're also using the test to diagnose different infections. Um, as well as different cancerous processes. Um, there's infections open that can infiltrate the stomach, that can infiltrate the colon, close. And we can do specialized stains and biopsies to try to rule those in or out. Open, close. close. Now we're in the back end of the small intestines and able to take samples again so overall we're getting representative samples of almost all segments of the bowel open just by doing endoscopy close so once we get a good evaluation of the bowel then i kind of go back to the, the as far down as we can to again vacu evacuate as much gas from the colon as we can to finish up our procedure to really minimize any discomfort or anything like that after the procedure and again any hemorrhage that's noted on the scope is all very minuscule um, uh, most of the time there's really no uh, effects of that on the back end, meaning we don't normally see bloody diarrhea or bloody vomiting. Most animals do very, very well with their endoscopy procedure and just essentially wake up a little sleepy from their procedure, um, but with a minimally invasive tool, able to get a lot of diagnostic information from them. We're done. And at the end of the procedure, they get a nice little mani-pedi because we all know how pleasant and much they love that when they're awake.